Hello, hello, and uh, hello, hello, and welcome back to another episode of Minority Reports podcast and digital series. I am your host, Mona Sheikh, you guys. Your host is all vaccinated up. Yeah, that's right. I got my vaccination. That's right. Feeling very secure about myself. I think this is the first time my self-esteem has been raised because I feel so secure because of the vaccine, you guys. Is that a thing? I don't know. But we're going to find out because my guest today, that's what he does. He critiques the creatives, you guys. That's what he does. And we're going to get into how do you become a film critic for the San Francisco Chronicle? Here's my very talented friend, Zaki Hassan. How are you? Hey, how's it going? Thanks for having me. Oh, my God. Thank you for being here. This is lovely. I, uh, you know, I like your uh, got your little blue shirt action going on. We both got the blue. This is- this is my blockbuster video shirt. Oh, I'm, look at that. I'm, I'm keeping the flag uh, flying for, for blockbuster uh, because we're all blockbuster kids. We're all blockbuster kids, man. No, uh, no, no, no denied there. How much would they charge if you would bring in late? What was their fee? Wasn't there a fee for it? It, it was ridiculous is what I remember. I couldn't put a, an exact dollar value on it, but I know being a high schooler, uh, you did not want to rack up blockbuster yeah. late fees. Yeah, it was expensive, man. I think it was yeah. like 50 or 80 bucks or something if you didn't return the blockbuster movie in time. It was like something stupid, <laughs> which is like a lot of money if you're in high school. You're like 50 $80. Like, that's a lot of money. They'd send someone to your house. They'd start breaking legs. It was it was crazy. I, man, I, I, don't know, I don't know which neighborhood you were living in, but that's not what they did in my... <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I grew up next to the projects in Jersey City, and they didn't even do that there. So I don't know what they're doing in the Bay Area, Zaki. Zaki, I have a question, man. First of all, yeah. how long have you been a film critic for for the San Francisco Chronicle? Uh, I've been writing for the Chronicle now for uh, about two years. Okay. Uh, before before that, I wrote for uh, Philly Weekly out of Philadelphia. I wrote for. Uh, Huff Post and gosh, I mean, I've I've written for a bunch of venues. I currently also write for IGN. Okay. So uh, I've been I've been uh, with a number of venues for for many many years now. I first started doing film reviews uh, for my high school newspaper about twenty five years ago. So that's oh. that's how that's how I got my start. And got it. I've I've been lucky because twenty five years later, I get to keep doing it. So. Man, uh, I mean, how does one become a film critic? Like, you just start, you just start, start talking smack, and then you're just like, "Yeah, <laughs> I said what I said." Yeah, you know, it's it's funny because I read, uh, not that not that I do it very often, but just recently I went back and I've been I've been adding some of my older reviews to my archive, you know, on Rotten Tomatoes, and I was reading some of my early early stuff, and I'm like, man. I would kick this kid's ass. Like, <laughs> like, like, who does he think he is? You know what I mean? Like that, that's, that's sort of my fascination because one thing I find is the older I get, the more equipped I feel to be able to do this. Cause I've just seen more stuff. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, and I, I mean, what, what is, what does a, a, a 16 year old have to say about anything really? Uh, that, that's my thought now as, as a college instructor where I'm like, man, some 16 year old going to tell me about what movie to watch. I'm gonna be like, keep on keep walking, you know? Right. That's <laughs> but, right. But I will say, I mean, but I was a film buff even back then, you know, I've, I've gr- I, I grew up loving, not just watching films, but reading about films. You know, even when I was in grade school, I would, I would go to the school library and I would check out the, you know, how did they make uh, King Kong? And, you know, like, what's the, how did they do special effects and things? That was just stuff that I was always interested in. So uh, yeah. I read a lot. And, and so I did build up a, a lot of, uh, knowledge just from that you know and then i got to keep keep writing about it so it's uh yeah it's been nice i mean when you're uh when you did you go to college for what journalism uh communication what did you go to school for uh so for for my my undergrad i went to uh, film school in in columbia college in chicago uh and so I did film and, and video production there. That's actually what my undergrad is. And then for my postgrad, I did communication studies. Um, and and so my my work as a journalist is really sort of to the side of the actual education uh, that I received. You know, because because right out of high school, I got a job at a local uh, community paper in Chicago. So I would do film criticism for them, and and I w- I kept writing even when I wasn't explicitly studying it. So it's kind of it's just funny that I ended up 
in in journalism as a profession, even though that's not something that I specifically pursued as an education. But but I mean, it, but my my education d- does. That's right. Serve, serve. I mean, did you want to be a filmmaker? And then you were like, you know what? Even more fun criticizing them. <laughs> um, I I think I did. I think I not 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 so much like like this is definitely what I want to do, but more like this is something I might want to do. That that was my thought. And the what I found is the more I got into the weeds on on the production side and putting stuff together, and it was it was great experience. I'm glad I had it, but I was just like, you know, I don't I don't like doing that. Yeah, uh, I like I like analyzing film. I like getting into the you know what is it saying? What's happening here? Uh, and so I just gradually shifted my focus, uh, you know, slightly to the side of of what my what my education uh, was supposed to be about, which I'm sure my dad is thrilled about because. They paid a lot of money to send me to film school. Oh, <laughs> man. Uh, how, much, how much money is it to go to film school? Um, well, this this was uh, coming up on 20 years ago. So it, wow. it was probably cheaper than it is now. But it, it was not cheap. It, it, I mean, it was not cheap. This is a private school. And uh, I was very grateful that my, my parents were willing to, 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 they were willing to be out of pocket to keep me from racking up debt and that's that's something i can never yeah i can't even sum up how grateful uh, i am to them for that you know dude how are brown parents cool 20 years ago having their kid <laughs> not go to medical school or law school and be like phil that's <laughs> very secure you go right ahead and we'll pay for it <laughs> you know what's funny is is they were very much not cool with it but to their credit they 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 knew that like me in med school was not going to happen. Me going to engineering school was not going to happen. Right? So they were like, all right, like, at least you're doing something, you know? Uh, but I can say for certain that when I, you know, when you have, you have the chat, you have the talk, uh, yeah. you know, mom, dad, I want to go to film school. That was, that was a, a, a difficult conversation to have, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I remember having a conversation very similar to that to with my family, but my family dynamics very different. I uh, I have four older brothers, and we used to live in Jersey City, and uh, my parents always lived in uh, Pakistan, and of course we lived here. And um, I remember I was like about to turn eighteen, and I came out of my uh, you know artist closet, and I sat my brothers down, and I was like, hey. I want to, I want to be a performer, you know, I want to go to acting school and, and my brothers gave me an ultimatum. They told me that either I was going to go to school and become like a physical therapist or something like that, or they were going to send me back to Pakistan. I was going to be married off to whoever mom tells me to be married off to. Those were my options, Zaki. So very different options. Do you think it would have been different for you had you been a girl, not a dude? I'm I'm fairly certain. Yeah, I I don't know what that even looks like. But yeah, I'm fairly certain. You know, in in my family, it's just it was just the two siblings. It's just me and my older brother. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's that's not something you know, I mean, it, it, I don't even have a point of reference to be like, how, uh, how would a, a sister, you know, have, have sure. functioned? I, I, and I have no idea, you know, one thing I will say is, you know, you say you have four older brothers, my, my daughter, she is the, the, the youngest uh, with four older brothers. Oh, also. wow. Wow. So, um, uh, but, you know, it's, it's, I, I, I didn't, I did not have a, a sister, uh, but I definitely look at with, with her, I, you know, as she, she's only four. She actually, her fourth birthday is tomorrow. Oh, nice. um, Happy birthday. But, you know, yeah, it's, and, and, and it's gone by like that, by the way. Yeah, but... um, and, and to that point, I mean, I know she's going to be turning 18 just like that soon. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's that question of like, well, yeah. uh, whatever life she wants to choose, you know, you, I want to try to be. Uh, as as accommodating and understanding uh, for whatever that is, and and I say that from my own experience, you know, because I'm I'm very fortunate because because nowadays we're sort of in an age where uh, uh, brown people are really breaking out into yeah. these non traditional fields. But I'll tell you what, I mean, it was pretty it was a pretty lonely road when I went off into that, a non non med non non engineering thing. Yeah, and you know, it's it's worked out. It's worked out pretty well. So. Yeah, good for you. I mean, that's amazing. Is she? Uh, is your daughter? Is she like the uh, princess of the family, or uh, is she? Or is she? Is she a tomboy? How is she? You know, you know, what's funny is is we call her Princess Tomboy. Ah, 
Because <laughs> because so because when when she needs to be, she's full on princess. I want the jewelry. I want the this. Want, but when she needs to, she can throw an elbow or two uh, <laughs> to get her way. So she knows she knows what's up. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> and listen, that's the that's the joy of having older brothers. They they teach you how to throw a punch. Yeah. Te- yeah, and they, and they are they are so protective of her. It's like, oh, that's it's very nuts, funny. you know. Yeah, her her immediate older brother, who's like two year, three years older, he's he's kind of a jerk, you know. But yeah. but the other ones, yeah, they're all they're all they're always protecting her. So that's oh, that's very sweet. <laughs> yeah, that that wasn't the case in my family. Uh, oh. <laughs> not at all. We were just beating the crap out of each other all day. Oh. Every day. Yeah, that's, oh, no. kind of, that's kind of what we did. Uh I mean. Zucky, you were, um, I, I wanted to actually ask you, you know, a, as someone who's on the creative side, you're on more on the critic side. I'm on the creative side. Uh, I'm not a filmmaker, but I am a stand-up comic. I am an, I'm an actor. I'm, you know, a performer. Um, you know, when I, when I, I, I have to be honest, I don't usually read the film critic's point of view because yeah. I'm the kind of person that I like to go make decisions on my own. I want to, yeah. if I watch a trailer and it catches my attention, I'll go watch it. Right. Yeah. How, how did this whole idea of film critics even come into, came into existence? Like that, that's yeah. what fascinates me, you know? Well, I mean, film criticism, obviously the progenitor is theater criticism. Uh, and and I mean uh, criticism of and and you know I I think the term itself we tend to view like oh you're criticizing me and that we view that as a negative and it's not inherently meant to be that way and obviously there's there's uh, you know, restaurant critics etc every every sure. artistic endeavor and and just to be clear you know what a lot of critics are are assholes yeah uh, you know and and they they derive sort of a, a sadistic glee in tearing down other people's endeavors. And and certainly for me, that's not my intention. That's never my intention. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I do try to be honest, right? But but the way the way I view my anything I write is I'm not saying everyone should think this way. I'm saying this is what I thought, and you can mm-hmm. you can take it or leave it, right? But mm-hmm. beyond that, I also view it as, and this is this is something I'm acutely aware of because of the venues I write for. You know, when you're in the Chronicle, when you're in, at IGN the people who made this thing are probably going to see it. They're going to see the review. Like it'll cross their path. Sure. Right? And, and so you have to ask yourself, do I want to be part of making this person's day better or worse? Mm-hmm. Because, because I believe there's value in a uh, negative critique that has uh, constructive elements to it. And so that for me, I, I'm, I'm not interested in just blowtorching any movie, even, even a movie that I don't like, I'm not going to say I liked it. If I didn't, I'll say, here's, it just didn't work for me, but I'll say here, here's the issues I had. And I will say, here's what I thought this was really effective. I would have liked to see more of this, what that they did. Why? Because, because, you know, that's kind of the point of this to me. It's like if, if, uh, if a friend asks me to read a script, kind of the same deal. I'm going to try to give a constructive critique, even if I don't like it. And that's, that's sort of, it's a position, you know, it's a position that affords you a a big audience, but there's a responsibility that comes with that. So I'm, I'm a, I'm a big believer in, in giving a constructive element, even when it's negative. With great power comes great responsibility. You got it. Spider-Man baby. Um, (laughs) (laughs) They nailed it. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. You know what it is? Sometimes I can, I sometimes read critics uh, like uh you know uh, like a film critic you know point of view and i'm just like well i don't i don't understand like i mm-hmm. i don't understand sometimes i've read certain criticisms about you know or you know by, by a film critic and i'm just like i watched the movie i freaking loved it i don't know what you're talking about like people were taking a giant shit on coming to america they were like coming to america the, stop the, se- the second one the second one and i yeah. was like I'm going to watch it because I, it has so many stand-up comedians in there. I'm like, just mm-hmm. the fact that there are stand-up comics in there, just for that alone, I'm going to watch it. And yeah. honestly, I loved it. Like, I thought it was great. I thought it was awesome. I loved the, the references. I, I loved the jokes. I, I, I loved the costumes, the dancing. Wesley Snipes, like, just stole the show. I mean, he was great in that. He needs to do more comedy. I mean, when the hell did we ever think that Wesley Snipes could do friggin' comedy? <laughs> yeah, it's true. 
Last time I checked, Wesley was dodging IRS to pay his taxes. I mean, that, <laughs> that's what Wesley became famous for, for God's which, sake. Which is itself pretty funny that he thought he could dodge Which is in itself is hilarious, right? <laughs> but Wes, I, I personally have always loved Wesley Snipes. I think he's so yeah. talented and I just love him. And now I love him even more because of yeah. what he did in Coming to America. Uh, and But I was just so baffled my how people were just like coming to america is a bad movie and i was like not in the slightest it's a really freaking good movie so what were your kind of thoughts on coming to america so coming to america you know i gave it like a like a like a medium review like i i i I lean it was like leaning positive you know Uh um and in that there were things i liked about it and i was definitely like it's you know what you know what i compared it to i was like uh, it's like, it was like watching, um, what did I say? It was like watching the very Brady Christmas, like the, the reunion movie with the, where they brought back the Brady bunch, like 20 years later and they're all a little older, but you're like, Hey, everybody's back. And it's fun to like, hang out with these people again. Okay. Uh, that was, that was my feeling on coming to America where I was like, I, I don't think it's as good as the first one, but I'm also like, I don't think it needs to be because this is just like spending a couple hours with these people who we liked. And I like uh, Akeem and I like, you know, I like, uh, I, I, what, one thing I didn't like is that uh, 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 Lisa is like barely a character in, in the, in the, in the sequel, the the wife. Yeah. Queen. Yes. And and that, that bugged me because I was like, she's so important to the first one. And she's like a, she's like the and in this one, which felt, Mm. felt wrong to me, you know, because, and, and, and I know, and, and one thing, the other thing I didn't like was uh, the way in which they contrived him having a son. Um, Because Uh, I was like, that's kind of gross. I was like, uh, you know, just sort of just dropping that in the middle of the movie. And I just thought it would be more interesting. Stand up comedy clubs. You know what kind of gross shit we talk about, (laughs) Zach? Well, I, I just mean like, like, I mean, he, he, he was, they've inserted like a uh, sexual assault into the story of the middle, into the middle of the first movie, which is, which is weird to me. You know what I mean? Because to me, it's like, well, I get it. You're trying to come up with a reason for him to, for him to have a son. And I thought, I, I, I really liked, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting his name, but the, the actor who played his son, I actually really liked him. And yeah. I liked the scenes with Eddie. And I was like, just make him. Uh, make uh, him you're his about, uh, Jermaine Fowler. Yes, yes, that's right. And he was he was on a show. A also, years stand- ago. yeah, also a stand-up comic. Yeah, and he he's great because I uh, uh, was a Superior Donuts. I think that was a, Superior Superior Donuts, a couple of years yeah, ago. That's it. And I really like. I liked him from that. He's very good. And, yes. And I was like, why not just like make him his son, like with his wife, and he like doesn't want to be part of the royal thing. He wants to go to America. Like you know what I mean? There was a way mm. I thought. Because because it's like you have to add like three different three steps in the middle to get there, but all that notwithstanding, I I didn't feel bad for having watched it, you know. And ultimately, that's what it comes down to. For a movie like this, you're like, well, did I enjoy myself? Did I laugh? I did. That's good enough for me. Yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, talking to you, does San Francisco Chronicle or I, I guess even other like film critics like. I, I don't know. Do you guys uh, get uh, a demand? Like, so for two weeks, Zaki has stopped writing film critics and they're like, where is Zaki? We can't watch a movie <laughs> without him. Please. I need your insight. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I'd love to think that we're that in demand, <laughs> but I'm not, I'm not naive enough. You know, I think if I, if I just magically disappeared tomorrow, I don't think anybody would miss my writing. Oh, you know? don't say that. Um, I'm gonna and I'm and I'm not like hum- I'm not trying to be falsely humble, but I'm like you know there's there's critics are a dime a dozen, right? Mm-hmm. But but that said, you know I think I think if a critic does their job well, and I, I hope I I do my job well, you know you, you create your you cultivate a voice. Yeah. And and uh, you know uh, what I always say, and and this gets to a broader conversation about Rotten Tomatoes and how it's sort of in my opinion, devalued what we do. Mm. But if you, if you, the, the, the trick is don't just look at individual reviews, find critics who you like. Interesting. Uh, and, and, and look for their opinion, you know, and that doesn't mean you're going to agree with them all the time. You know, sure. when I, when I was a kid, uh, Roger Ebert, who was a sure. Chicago, Chicago based yeah. critic, um, yeah. he was like the guy, you know, I was in Chicago growing up and, and Gene Siskel was there and Roger Ebert. They were both from there. Did you know that um, he went on a date with Oprah? I, I did know that. Yeah. yeah. And he's the one who encouraged Oprah to own her show. 
look at that. So, so he, he gets to, he has a little piece of that legend, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but he, you know, for me, I would get on the, uh, the, I'd go to the Chicago Sun-Times website every Friday. I would read the new Chicago, uh, Roger Ebert reviews in the, in the Sun-Times. And like I said, I, I wouldn't always agree with him, but I loved his writing. I still love his writing. And mm -hmm. to this day, it tells you something, 20 plus years later, I still remember specific turns of phrase in mm. specific reviews like i could pull up a review and be like I, I remember in his review of this he said like this he said it a certain way and i remember that you know mm. uh and so that's really what inspired me and it's one of the great uh uh losses in my life that i i never got the opportunity to to ask him to critique my critiques mm -hmm. um, i never had that chance you know that's something i would have dearly loved but but truthfully i mean he he was such an inspiration to me yeah, yeah, I bet. I mean, uh, I mean, growing up, uh, I mean, who's the film critic you turn to? Roger Ebert, right? Yeah. Roger yeah. Ebert, he was the man. Uh, he was the guy. James, yeah, James here said, does Zaki review foreign films or indie films the same way as big budget Hollywood films? That's a great question. And and the answer is yes and no. And I'm not dodging, I will explain. Um, I, think, I think what I try to do is... Uh, judge the film based on what's expected of it. So obviously a, a micro budget movie uh, or, or an indie movie is not trying to be a four quadrant blockbuster. So you're not going to judge it the same way. Uh, ultimately though, the, the criteria is exactly the same. When the movie ends, I just, I take stock of my feelings. I'm like, how did I feel? Mm -hmm. Now that this movie is done, how did it make me feel? Do I feel good about it? Why? Do I feel bad about it? Why? And I just kind of unpack my thoughts. And that's for me, that's part of the reason why, uh, generally speaking, I need to, I need, I need sort of a debrief period before I can start a review. You know, I know I have some, some colleagues who like, they'll watch it and they'll just go home and type the review. And I just, I'm not able to do that. Mm. I need to, start, I need to let it sit. Mm. Uh, and I need to sort of, you know, uh, uh, interface with my feelings. Marinate. It. It needs to marinate. Yeah, marinate. Exactly. Uh, that's the perfect term. And, yeah. and, and, you know, and, and sometimes uh, you, you'll have an initial positive reaction and then it kind of, it, it calcifies a little bit. In which case, you know, I try to, I try to bring that into the writing. I say, well, this is how I felt before, but this, you know, as I thought about it, this happened. Um, just give, give an honest reaction, you know? Right. right. James says Siskel and Ebert were wonderful on TV for years. Yeah, they were. They were great. I, I agree with you. I agree with you about Zaki about the fact that I, and, you know, and I, that's not something that I actually thought about until you articulated is that you find your favorite critic and you just follow them. You don't, mm -hmm. you know, you mentioned Rotten Tomatoes. Now, why do you feel Rotten Tomatoes devalues? Well, I think I think what Rotten Tomatoes does is people look at that number and they're like, oh, it's bad. Or oh, it's good, right? And mm -hmm. and the Rotten Tomatoes number, which is you know, let's say a movie has been rated sixty five percent, right? And so you say, oh well, that's a D, that's terrible, right? And what that is actually is it's sixty five percent of critics l are leaning positive or extremely positive about the movie, right? And so what that means is, out of hundreds of critiques, uh, every one of those critiques, which which spans a spectrum, right? So it's not just good bad. I mean, there's a spectrum in there, but they're being it's it's binary. It's it's being uh, cl uh, uh, classified as good or bad, and mm -hmm. just like that, th think about it this way: uh, your average critique is anywhere from six hundred to twelve hundred words. Well, there's a lot more contained within that than it's good or it's bad. Uh huh. You know? and and you know, Siskel and Ebert on their show, they would even you know they would say, all right, two thumbs up or split vote. And I mean, even that was boiling down a fairly nuanced analysis, right? And right. so this drives me crazy. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm on Rotten Tomatoes and I'm, I'm grateful for the exposure, but I'm also cognizant of the way it, it, it turns what we do into Yelp reviews, you know? And I think, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all people do is look at that number. They don't look at the critique. And that's why I'm always like, even when you go to Rotten Tomatoes, see what the critics you like are saying. And again, when I say like, I don't mean agree with, because you will disagree with the critics mm -hmm. that you like. But what are they saying? What's the, that's, that's what you want to look at. Yeah. You know, like, that's a very interesting point because, you know, uh, film art is subjective, right? I mm -hmm. mean, so it really is about following certain critics who probably have similar tastes than you do to, to you, right? They have like similar tastes to you. So, yeah, uh, yeah I mean, I, I, I think it's hard to just be like, well, 
you know, just like you said, I like this about coming to America. I didn't like this about coming to America. And then you mm-hmm. try to give like an overall score to be like, this works, this doesn't work, you know, right. rather than being mm-hmm. like, that's an atrocious movie. Okay, unless it's like freaking Gili, then you're <laughs> like, okay, I gotta go. Like, this yeah. sucks. Um, Or, um, man, I remember that movie that came out. Uh, you're my, oh, goodness. Who's the director of Black Swan? Black Swan. Remember Black Swan? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, Ar- Aronofsky. 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 I think you and I both know the kind of director he is. I think he's brilliant, but a lot of people get really freaked out by his stuff, right? The last yeah. movie that he made, what was about being in a house, and you know, there's a couple. Um, and then there's a scene where the woman's pregnant, she gives birth, and then do you know which movie I'm referring to? Uh, uh, m- mother. Mother. Yeah, with, with uh, movie, uh, Jennifer Lawrence. Yes. And that movie was just so dark. Mm-hmm. Um, something like that. Because it, it almost feels like, you know, it's like when you go to a museum and you watch uh, abstract art, you know, you're just like, you can interpret this in many, many ways. So what? Yeah. what is this? art mean exactly so when i watched mother to me it was a pretty abstract movie i remember watching it with friends and my friends were like i fucking hated it fuck (laughs) that guy that movie sucked and i was like dude relax it's aronofsky he's brilliant he's a brilliant brilliant director i'm i love him he's doing something i mean you're reacting that strongly so he's doing that's right that's right he was like that kind of negativity he's putting out in the world I was like, I don't think he's putting on negativity. He is an artist. He's showing you his vision, you know, and maybe you don't have to watch it. You don't have to agree with it, but he is an artist. It's subjective. Yeah. I um, I thought that this scene was pretty dark, but when you watch something like that, is it hard to criticize a movie like that? Uh, like Mother? That I, Honestly, that kind of a critique is almost easier to get into not not because it's easier to criticize but because it allows for sort of a conversation right uh-huh. so so i mean I, like you know full disclosure i wasn't a, i wasn't a big fan of mother mm-hmm. but i appreciate it, but i appreciate it you know what i mean and mm-hmm. so there's that nuance of like well i didn't like it but i appreciated it i appreciated what he was doing and I, you know i just it didn't necessarily land for me but but what i'm just doing right here that allows for you're going to get a conversation starter. You can start writing. You can you you know your thoughts start coming out, uh, right. and so that that's hopefully something meaningful. You know, I, I find that more interesting than, for example, doing kind of your average blockbuster, because right. at at some some point, like I'll give you an example. You know, I just did a my review for for Godzilla versus Kong, uh, which I did like, but I'm also like that's a critic proof movie. Right. right. In right. that, if it if it's called Godzilla versus Kong, well, the people who are watching that movie are showing up for Godzilla versus Kong, and if you get that, like uh, you're just, you're getting what 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 was advertised, right? So so that's almost harder to like find a meaningful conversation about. Yeah. Even though I, even though again I did like it versus something like Mother, where even if you don't like it, you can like. You can get into it, you know. You can right. do. Well, how does it make you feel? Why does it make you feel that way? What's he saying? What's he doing? You know, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, James said, "What after watching hundreds of films, does Zaki ever find movies now where he gets an emotional response watching them, or is it cold evaluation?" Ooh, cold. That's a good question. So, so th- is this in reference to like watching new films or rewatching older films? Right, because. Yeah, he's like uh, after watching hundreds of films, does like he ever find movies, ne- now, movies where now. He gets emotional? Yeah, now that he gets emotional response watching them. Yeah, or- oh. absolutely, absolutely. I mean, that's like I, you know, I it's impossible for me to ever be cynical about about film because there's so many great films being made. You know, uh, the the stuff this year, you know, Nomadland, Minari. You oh, know, uh, goodness. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, it, it it it's it's always there's always something new. And and that's what's great, you know. I I think uh, the truth is, in in many ways, uh, uh, picking up on James's question, uh, I find myself getting more emotional now because I just feel as I get older, I just I, I'm more plugged into my emotions yeah. and I'm more honest with my emotions, you know. And it's weird the stuff that that speaks to me, you know. I mean, I remember um, 
uh, watching Spotlight for the first time, like five, six years ago, uh, just getting emotional about that. And it's it's a very simple story. It's a very simple story about a complex, complex investigation, you know, but when mm-hmm. you when you see uh, Mark Ruffalo just break down and he's like, they, they knew and they let it happen. I mean, it's, uh, it's impossible not to be affected by it, you know? Right. Um, right. So, 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 I mean, to, to that point, I think, I think I, uh, the more movies I watch, the more open I am to all the different ways they can surprise me. Right. Right. Do you ever, do you ever watch a movie and you're like, damn, like that movie messed me up. <laughs> Uh, I've definitely had that reaction. I'm trying to think of of a movie that left me with that reaction, but I've absolutely had that reaction. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll have to. I'll have to. Uh, I'll have to marinate on that. You have to marinate. You have to. You have to marinate on that. That's fair. That that's fair. <laughs> I I mean, man. I uh, you know, I I think about you know, like you're, you're a you're a film critic and what you do. I mean. Uh, you're a film critic for life. Like, do you go on to do, what? What else is a film critic? Do you write a book about all the films that you've criticized and <laughs> put together a book of all the, uh, you know, all your reviews on books, like how, on on movies? How, how does that work? That's a, you know, that's really something because that's that's one of those conversations that I've had with with my wife recently, where she's like, "What? Like, what's the end game here?" And I was like, "Well, I guess I just review a bunch of movies and then eventually I die. I guess like." <laughs> I don't know what you know. What I mean, um, I mean, I'm I'm lucky, right? Because when you think about it, I I love movies. I get to watch movies, and I get paid to write about them. Well, good, for goodness' sake, like I mean, I mean that's 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 the good life. Yeah. And if that's if that's it, yeah. Hey, you know what? I can't complain. I hope yeah. it's not it. You know, I'm. Uh, uh, yeah, I've I've got books that I would I I would like to be involved in. I've been lucky to be. A contributor to many books, and you know, I, I have a, I have a week, a biweekly podcast with my with my uh, creative partner, yeah. who you know we've been doing that for close to ten years, and it's just us shooting the breeze talking about movies. Yeah, and it's just, I mean, we're we're, and he's he's, you know, to your point, he's a uh, creative in the industry. He's a he's a writer, and so the conversations we have are very meaningful because I'm able to offer critique from this area and he's able to offer mm-hmm. his perspective from this area and so that ends up being something yeah. uh hopefully worthwhile you know yeah you know uh we're talking about uh critique and criticism uh this is how vastly uh different our worlds are uh zaki well you're talking about criticism on films i get comments like this on my live stream why no makeup lips color uh Smile. Smile. Oh, I, I was going to I was going to say that as a joke, but there it is. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Why don't you <laughs> smile more because that's not something women hear often uh in the street. Yeah. He wants to want to see full dresses. You're you know, these are the kind of uh douchebag uh misogynistic criticisms that we get as women. Yeah. Uh, if I could stand up, I would show you my full dress. Sorry. <laughs> Zaki, I think he is asking for your full dresses, and yeah. I think it's time for you to show the full dresses. Uh, <laughs> where's the full? Is it a blockbuster dress? What is it? It, it is. Okay. It, it is a block. It is a blockbuster night. So look at that is. man! It's uh, the, the blockbuster. <laughs> uh, you know, now with this uh, influx of uh, Hulu and Netflix and Disney yeah. Plus and Paramount TV and all the like, uh, you know HBO Max, do you feel like we are? in a place where people are just overloaded with content mm-hmm. where they're like, yeah. I don't know what to watch. It's like overwhelming content. And do you think eventually because of it, these award shows will become, you know, erroneous because how many freaking it's happening? Yeah. How many yeah, films and TV shows are they going to nominate? Like how many? Yeah. I, I think what you, you hit on, something that's a very real concern. I was actually talking about this exact thing with my students earlier this week. You know, there's a there's a, a concept that's come into vogue called the paradox of choice, which is the idea that given uh, just an overwhelming number of options, which Netflix does, you know, I mean, just row after row after row, we tend to not choose anything and we just gravitate towards what we already know. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I was reading an article about how the most viewed uh, content during the pandemic, uh, Friends, the Office, The Simpsons. Wow, and that tells you something, right? Because because you, I, I know I've been there. Netflix, you're like scroll, 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 doom scroll. Eventually, you're like, you know what? 
uh, let's just watch episode five of season three of The Simpsons again, you know? And 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 to your point, you know, we're at an age now where it's it's never, if you're a content creator, there's never been a, a better time to get your work made. Sure. But there's never been a worse time to get your work seen. <laughs> exactly. And that, right? I mean, I mean, I'm sure... I could go to a restaurant and strike up a conversation and just make up a show and say, I created this show and just make up a streaming service that it's on. And people would like reasonably believe it because there's just so many anyway. Yeah. And that's, that's the trade off, right? You know, when you think about it in 1997, Titanic came out in December and it was number one at the box office for 16 weeks. Four months, it was number one at the box office, right? So so that wasn't just new audiences. That was people going back again and again. Why? Because they wanted to experience that again. And and that type of thing, I mean, it's never happened since then, and it never will. Right. Because the turnover is so rapid. And it's only going to get worse, by the way, because mm-hmm. because the theatrical window it has shrunk to basically nothing. Even when we're out of the pandemic, it's going to be a month at most from theater to streaming. Right. And it, the, the churn, it's just too much. And, yeah. and it's a shame. Yeah, I mean, I think about like, you know, your Oscars and your Golden Globes and, you know, and I'm just like, okay, so people already don't really respect the Grammys anymore because they're like people, you know, it's it's nonsense. It's not just five categories. It's like some 60 some odd categories. They don't even Mm -hmm. show those categories. They only show five or 10 categories. Um, so I, I and I'm just wondering, you know, Oscar. It's like, oh, if you go to the Oscars, it's like the Oscars, right? Mm-hmm. It's like the thing. But I'm looking at all this content that's churning out. Um, yeah. I watched Nomadland, loved it. I'm gonna watch yeah. Minari. Uh, watched uh, Promising Young Woman. That was amazing. Uh, mm-hmm. I thought it was freaking great. Um, and you know, all, all this kind of con- and I just look at it and I'm just like, there's no way in hell they're going to be able to nominate it then then i guess then the question begins it com- comes to um who decides what movies how many movies they have to watch and how many movies do they have to pick from right now mm-hmm. maybe they're picking from 20 but 5 yeah. 10, 5 years from now or even 2 years from now they have 50 movies to pick from how do yeah. you do that do you expand categories do you come up with a brand new award show how mm-hmm. does that even work you know well, I mean, right now the Oscars have like a ten li- uh, a ten picture limit uh-huh. uh, for best picture, which is which is expanded from a couple of years ago. It used to be five, and so they kind of they they have up to ten slots. And you'd be surprised actually, because because no matter how many films are released in a year, the process tends to be the same, which is it gets whittled down to a handful because of the you know b- before you get to the Oscars, you every city has their critics awards. And and so certain front runners start to emerge. It's a little bit like a presidential primary, you know. If you think about it, like mm-hmm. before we ended up with with Joe Biden, the, it was like a just a clown car, right? And, and it's not meant to be pro or against Joe Biden, but I mean, it, it, at the start, I mean, like, oh my gosh, how are we going to pick, right? And then it just kind of got whittled down. the The Oscar nomination mm-hmm. race is very similar in that sense that once certain films are getting recognized at the critic awards from in the big cities, you know, we do it in San Francisco, Chicago, New York, all the big ones, St. Louis, uh, uh, Toronto, even and by the time it gets time for Oscar nominations, the, the field is, is about eight or nine movies. Wow. 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 Uh, James is, uh, asking another question. He said, we've talked about a possible stand up comedy Renaissance after COVID. Does Zucky think we'll have a movie Renaissance now that movies are being made again? Well, I mean, they they never stopped making movies, really. There was a brief lull for about a month or two, but they got back into the swing of things pretty quick. So there is there's a big backlog of completed films that are just sitting there waiting to be released. So I think absolutely we're going to see a whole, you know, especially in terms of the blockbusters. You know, there's uh, Fast and Furious. They got is is ready to go. They're just I think it's this summer. The James Bond movie is ready to go. The Black Widow, et cetera. Jurassic Park. Lots of stuff is coming. New Batman. Uh, the question is what what happens to the theatrical viewing experience? That's the question: is when theaters are at capacity or uh, uh, able to admit capacity, will people want to go back? And 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 I have a question mark surrounding that, not necessarily because of pandemic fears, but I think people have just gotten used to, well, I can just watch it at home. And yeah. So 
I wonder, and what I've said is I think theater going is going to be a little bit like vinyl where you're going to have like the hardcore fans who are, who will always want that experience. But I think it's going to start whittling down with each like. subsequent generation. I mean, like, like if you look at the cost of um, a big, a ginormous TV, like 70 inches or whatever, it's mm-hmm. not a lot. It's like six, no. 700 bucks. If that a very yeah. expensive projector, not a lot of money. Um, what it costs to have a family like yours. You have five kids, right? Yeah. That's seven folks, including you and your wife. Seven yeah. people to go to the movie theater. Dude, I don't even know what that bill is like for you. What is that? Yeah. Like, upwards of $200, $250? <laughs> I mean, it, it's like I don't go to nighttime shows, right? I will go to the right. first show Saturday morning because it's like half, you know? And and yeah, I'm I'm lucky because for a lot of the big releases, I watch them, you know, if when theaters are around, I go to like a press screening. That's for right. free. That's so, right. So, you know, and, and I can usually take one or two of my kids with me. So it's like I'm I'm not the the median moviegoer in that sense because I'm right. saving a lot of money that way. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, between ticket prices and and uh, uh concessions. Yeah, you're looking at about 100 150 bucks. Right. So then so I had a conversation with an executive at a very big studio a while back. Um and she was telling me that multiplexes will become a thing of the past. And that is happening very quickly. And mm-hmm. I think the pandemic has even expedited that process. I think a lot of people are pretty um uh, you know uh unsure uh, it's still about going to the theater. Uh, I mean, come October, it, it might be a different conversation because I think about 80, 85% of the country would be vaccinated by then, but we yeah. still have to see if there are any new outbreaks and, you know, whatever, 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 uh, a few X, you know, X, uh, you know, question marks that we have, uh, related right. to COVID. But uh, I wanted to ask you, do you think that multiplexes, will sooner than later become a thing of the past. Like you said, it's a vinyl thing where it's like only the hardcore movie fans are going to be left where, you know, it's just going to be one multiplex in you know, like one neighborhood because nobody goes to watch movies anymore. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think we'll see a, a significant drop in the number of multiplexes for sure. Like, you know, using my, my own neighborhood as an example, I have two, big like 30 screen theaters two different chains that are within five minutes of each other well wow. i mean that's that's not going to be sustainable in the long run especially if if given given where the the movie going economy is right now mm-hmm. they, they've got a lot of catching up to do i think i think the theatrical experience will always be something that's in demand for your big for your you know uh your avengers and that type of thing you know to have that big kind of theme park ride experience i think for smaller films they're they're we're already seeing it they're skipping theaters you know i there was a time when uh, uh you know it, a titanic i'm just using that as an example i mean that was your big spectacle mm-hmm. but it was it was a big hit the same time as goodwill hunting right? mm. and, and and goodwill hunting which is an amazing movie i i don't think that would go to theaters today i think that would be amazon prime picks it up or or Netflix picks it up, you know, um, and and that would be a shame when you think about it, right? Because because that was a really zeitgeisty movie. It launched Matt Damon's career. That's right. And today today it would be like it would be talked about, right? I'm sure it would be appreciated, but it would disappear pretty quick, right? Uh, and that's a shame. Right, 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 right. Um, man, I mean, movies are my life. Uh, there was an article that came out uh, during the pandemic last year. And uh, I swear to God, I think this article was written by a Brown parent because it was written (laughs) as essential jobs in non-essential jobs. And Mm. I kid you not, Saki, the number one essential job was doctors. And the number one non-essential job was artists. What? What What a shame, right? I was like, what do you think you're home watching right now? It's yeah. artists. It's us. Like content creators, like actors, uh, comedians. It's artists. Like you would lose your freaking mind, you know, if it wasn't for to turn Netflix on and put your kids in front of the TV. Like, for right. God's sake, what are you talking about? I mean, lucky, okay, like the, the, do you feel that artists are underappreciated in our society? You know, it's interesting. I I think they're they're 
both underappreciated and overappreciated for the wrong thing. Huh. Because in in that, you know, I, I just read a, a, a poll the other day of, uh, of, of kids. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, the, the, jo- the number one job they want to have. And instead of it being doctor, engineer, it's like YouTube, uh, YouTuber. And, stuff. and I, was, <laughs> I was like, well, that's a shame. Right. And, and not to, <laughs> not to dog on uh, YouTube, you know, people who, who, who have YouTube channels and stuff. But I'm just like, I feel like they're they're focusing on the, the notoriety and the dollar signs, the potential dollar signs, as opposed to the the craft right like like that that's what art is right it's 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 uh it's expressing something that's deep inside you that you just need to get out there that's what art is you know and it whatever the art you're doing whether it's a, whether you're a comedian or, or a a chef yeah. you know it, and 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 i feel like we we overlook that the the emotional and mental health aspect of being an artist and people tend to look at the dollar signs. Mm-hmm. So I want to be, uh, I want to be famous, you know. Mm. Uh, and and that's you know I always say I I tell my students this all the time. I'm like, uh, ask people who are famous if they like being famous, you know. That's right. <laughs> that's right. I think um, you know Cameron Diaz has been pretty vocal ever since she stopped making movies and shows, yeah. and she's been very vocal. She's like, I was miserable. I was miserable being famous. She's like, it was hard. People come at you from all angles. They constantly criticize you for dumb shit. And she's like, I was over it. She was like, it sucked my soul being yeah. famous. Like, and she was like, that's why I had to get out of the spotlight. And I just wanted to go start my family and just mind my own business. I just wanted to yeah. get out of the spotlight. So you're absolutely right. Ask the famous people, you know, the narcissists love it because, ooh. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. the narcissists and the sociopaths. Oh, they love it. They eat it up in a freaking, you know, cereal bowl. Are you kidding me? Yeah. They love that. <laughs> but if you're like, if you're like even a remotely emotionally, mentally healthy, mental healthy person, you're just like, I'm not down for this. Like, this is too much. This is, yeah. you have to kind of find that balance to ground you, you know? Um, I feel like, you know, whenever I talk to or have come across uh, you know, stab- very established producers or even very established actors, uh, male or female. One of the key things I always hear from them is that my family keeps me grounded. Mm-hmm. My family keeps me grounded. You know, all this is nice and it's great, but I like to go home. I want to go home yeah. to my family. I want to go home to my kids. I want to go home to my wife or husband or whatever. Yeah. Um, is that the same for film critics? I think, you know, when we, when, when you talk about achieving notoriety right i i it, it's very much what you're saying really speaks to you know something i've i've said to my wife about where i'm like i don't want to be famous but i want a level of notoriety where i can get people to return my calls i can walk down the street but i can get a but, but i can get a phone call return i mean to me that's that's the sweet spot that's right down the middle right Got it. uh and and you know that's uh you know, there's a great line in uh, in the movie The Insider, which is you know it depicts a, a true story of of uh, 60 Minutes, right? So Al Pacino plays a 60 Minutes producer uh, named Lil Bergman, and so he has a line in the movie where he's he's essentially had a falling out with his company, and he's telling his wife, he says, he says, I'm Lil Bergman from 60 Minutes. I don't know how many times I've said that on the phone. You leave off the second part, nobody cares who you are. Mm. And and. You know, I'll tell you, I mean, I've been writing for the Chronicle a long time. I've sent out a lot of emails where I say, hey, I'm Zachy Hassan, I'm with the Chronicle, and I get something back pretty quickly. And I always tell myself, I, I have to tell myself, I'm like, they're responding to the Chronicle part. They don't care who I am. Mm-hmm. And and that's 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 a little piece of perspective that I find very helpful. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, you know, don't, don't ever start uh, believing you're too much of a thing, you know? Right. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I think for me, d- this job, what I've learned, honestly, is for me, I, I do it for love. And I do it because I believe film critique is art. I truly do believe that. I think you can write something meaningful and, and passionate mm-hmm. about somebody else's art. Um, sure. But but ultimately, you are there to solve someone else's problem. You are there because an editor thinks of you as somebody who's going to help them fill column inches. Mm. That's it. That's the job. 
So you do the job. If you have to make changes, you make the changes. You meet your deadlines, you'd be easy to deal with. That's that's all it is for me. You know, I I am I feel so lucky that I've gotten these opportunities. Uh, and many of the times I've gotten them, it's because somebody vouched for me. Somebody's like, oh, you should give you should give Zachy a call. He, he'll do a good job for you. And I'm grateful for that. What does that mean? It means you do the work. That's it. Right. Like there, right. there's no faking. There's no faking it. That's it. You do the work. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, if we have to fill out inches and columns, then why can't we start reaching out to employees in corporate America and let them give reviews of their home, of their bosses, of how they're performing <laughs> per week? Wouldn't that be amazing? It would be. They wouldn't have those jobs for very long, though, right? That's very true. We'll just keep them anonymous. <laughs> yeah. Bob at Microsoft, not very happy this week yeah. with the boss going through a divorce not, and, and taking that shit out of us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Kind of a jerk, yeah. I know, kind of a jerk. <laughs> I don't know what his problem is. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, you know. Hey, our uh, writing messages like, I-, I know my boss is cheating on his wife, uh, but hey, I guess his wife just has to find out, huh? <laughs> what do you say? Uh, <laughs> wink, wink, <laughs> wink, wink. Um, Zaki, uh, we're gonna start wrapping up soon, my friend. But I wanted to, uh, I wanted to actually uh, ask you about. Uh, do you so it's just film critic critiquing no t- television show critiquing uh i do television as well yeah and i've i've actually it's that uh uh the amount of me doing that has gone up over the last year just because there have been more opportunities uh you know so so just in this past month i did uh, i did a review of of the you know uh WandaVision and uh, the Falcon and Winter Soldier, Superman, the new Superman show. Man, uh, those are all those are all for the paper. What did you think of WandaVision? I loved it. I thought it was fantastic. Really? I, I thought I thought it was a great. I mean, it's you know, it's it's funny because because it, you know, with, with these Marvel things, right? It's I'm I'm always like, look, you gotta expect that it's going to be within the range of what we expect from these marvel things so the only question is is it good within that range and i thought for the most part this show did some interesting things you know within the sort of the the radius of what we expect from those it sort of ended up in a way that was relatively predictable but i enjoyed the road to getting there yeah i mean i didn't some things i just couldn't predict which i thought was awesome Mm -hmm. um what bothered me and people close your ears. If you haven't seen it, it's going to spoil <laughs> alert. Um, I've initially when the first episode launched and the second one, I was like, this is weird. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, is this supposed to be like a sitcom, but it's not funny. Like, what is yeah. this? Like what, yeah. what is happening? Uh, I think what really bothered me was the premise. I thought the premise was fucking lame dude i thought it was (laughs) lame um here's the thing if tragedy has hit your life where you lost your family you've lost your brother you lost the love of your life and then you're like i'm gonna go and take over an entire town in new jersey new (laughs) jersey of all the places in the world you couldn't take over a beautiful place in Italy or Spain or even like what New Jersey <laughs> who goes to New Jersey I grew up in Jersey City you don't go to New Jersey they call it the garden state there's no fucking garden there okay it's just a state that's all it is okay <laughs> the state the state and I was like <laughs> okay that's cool so you lost everything and then you mind control these people and then you put them in this kind of lock of this you know this this world that you've created for yourself because you have so much pain and then at the end the line that freaking killed me was like they'll never know what she sacrificed for this oh get the hell out of here right now <laughs> get out of here what do you mean you know never know it wasn't the poor people's fault they had nothing to do with the pain why yeah. you know it's like you know when they say hurt people hurt people and i was mm. like she didn't they didn't poor the poor people didn't do anything and then there's a witch thrown in there i'm like oh we got witches in here now what is <laughs> happening right now you know <laughs> don't get me wrong their makeups and their costumes are awesome and i yeah. love seeing the diversity the di- they did a really really good job you know asif ali's in there yeah, um okay. you know a uh, lot of other like really diverse cool people were in there and i was like okay i love it but i was just i just 
they lost me at the premise, man. It's just yeah. like, if you're going through a pain, that's the, you know, I have much compassion for you, but why the fuck you're taking over New Jersey? <laughs> well, I think a couple points. I mean, I think, I think that's a fair critique. What I, what I would say is that the nice thing about being in this universe where the story never really ends is like everything is a down payment on a development later on. And we know that uh, we're going to be seeing Wanda again in one of these movies at some point. And, you know, one expects that the stuff that happened here will pay, pay off down the line. And, and we, uh, I don't know, I feel reasonably certain. And if I'm wrong, you can, uh, you can yell at me again, but I feel like, Oh my God, that, I wasn't yelling. I hope I wasn't yelling at you. No, no, no. I, you can, you can, you can, no, no, you weren't yelling at me. You can be like, Hey, you were wrong, dude. Um, I feel like the people being pissed off at her. Uh huh is going to come back as a story point. And again, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. But that, that's, that's my... But I mean, when you think about it, that's what you can do in this Marvel universe that is sort of unique. Like, we've never had that, where it's like, here's a story. It started in here, and we're going to pick it up here. We're going to pick it up there. And it just... it's The ball keeps rolling. And right? that's kind of... To me, that's the fun of it. Yeah. Full disclosure, I think when it comes to the Marvel shows, I'm, I'm uh, extra biased because it's just like, it's a thing I share with my kids. Yeah. And... Like, you know, for us, Friday afternoons is like Marvel show time. Right. You know, they get done with their classes. I get done with my class. We just sit down. We watch the new Marvel show. Okay. And I think to myself, I'm like, man, you know, this is like, they're going to remember this. Like, that's yeah. gonna be like, oh, this is a thing we did yeah, with dad. You know? sure. and that's cool, you know. But yeah. I, I don't think you're wrong. I don't think you're wrong. I, I hope that, that's, that those specific plot points you're bringing up, I do hope that that's something that they don't just sort of uh, broom under the rug, you know? That yeah. They come back to that. Yeah, I hope so too. Listen, I'm a Marvel kid. Like, I am obsessed with Marvel. Like, obsessed. I am a Marvel girl through and through. And I nice. think for me, uh, WandaVision kind of just threw me off a little bit. And I was like, what mm-hmm. happened, you know? I mean, Jesus, uh, anything to do with Avengers, anything to do with anything, like, Freaking yeah. Captain America, like geez, I'm obsessed with Captain America. I, you know, I, I even love Thanos. I'm like Thanos is the man, man. It like scares the crap out of me. Freaking love it. Um, I thought the <laughs> Avengers was done so well. I started watching uh DC's uh League, the the new one that just came out. What's it called? Yeah, League? Z- League. Zack Snyder's. Justice Zack Snyder's. Snyder's. Yeah. It's what? a different. It's a different. Uh, it's a different flavor of ice cream. That's what I always say. What did you think? Four hours? Who's got that kind of time? Well, I, uh, I, 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 I had to for a professional reason. Well, yeah, for, so that's, for, that's for, for me, someone like me who works a lot, for yeah. me, it's going to take me about two weeks to finish that movie. Yeah, you know what? What I did in the lead up to that, and I, I'm, I'm glad I did, even though it was more of a time commitment. Is I watched, uh, I rewatched Man of Steel. From 2013, I rewatched Batman versus Superman, and there's like an extended version of that. I watched that in the lead up to Justice League, and I was just like, I want to view this as one big story, which is obviously uh, the filmmaker's intent, and that that helped a lot. And I I I enjoyed Snyder's Justice League, Uh Uh, and actually, I I, I, and I watched that with my kids too. Actually, we we ended up marathoning the four hours rather than breaking it up. Okay. And truthfully, it, it went by pretty quickly, but it's it's definitely it's one of those things where I'm like, this is not going to be for everybody. It just isn't. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I I don't you know people who have negative reactions to to those films, I I get it because I watched I watched Batman versus Superman five years ago. It came out five years ago today, in fact. And I my text I tweeted I was like I think I hated this movie. That was my tweet about Batman versus Superman. And so I didn't bother revisiting it. And so I revisited it this past week, and I appreciated it more as part of you know, it's like a story with a beginning, middle and end. Mm-hmm. And I liked it more for that. But yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, you know, uh, 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 have some, have some hydration handy. If you're going to, yeah. if you're going to watch it. Yeah. 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 I mean, I don't have anything against DC comics. I think Wonder Woman was great. The first one was like perfect. It was like yeah, so perfect. Really and then the second one, again, I think the premise means a lot. I mean, if you don't have a strong premise, it makes it difficult. What did you think of Wonder Woman 2? Um, I I really like uh, Gal Gadot and, in the role, and I really yeah. like Chris Pine um, as the love interest, so I enjoyed seeing them together. Mm-hmm. 
I didn't, I wasn't a big fan of the movie, but I really, I liked Pedro Pascal mm -hmm. and I liked uh, Gal Gadot and Chris Pine. So I, I think what I said in my critique is I was like, I think it's worth watching just for them because I think they're very good. Yeah. Uh, it, to me, to me, you know, the first Wonder Woman, there's the scene when she first reveals herself, she goes onto the battlefield. Yes. And it, to me, that's like out of all the superhero movies we've ever seen, that's like a top three scene. Mm -hmm. I think it's amazing. And we don't have anything like that in the second one. You know, I, I, yes. I, I think it's just, I think it's just okay. Like I didn't, I didn't dislike it. Mm -hmm. But it was it's a step down from from the first one for sure. Is it do you think like is it because she did such a great job on Wonder Woman 1? Like she really had to bring it for Wonder Woman 2 because the the standard is so high now, right? Mm -hmm. Because of Wonder Woman 1. And it's usually hard to like so for me I'll compare that to Guardians of the Galaxy. When I watched the first okay. Guardians of the Galaxy, didn't know much about the characters, loved mm -hmm. it. Then I was yeah. like, ooh, Guardians of the Galaxy 2. I'm like, ooh, how are they going to top the first one? The first one was so good. I watched yeah. the second one. I was like, man, they knocked it out of the park, man. They were amazing. It was amazing. I've watched Guardians of the Galaxy 1, first and second. I mm -hmm. don't even know how many times I've watched it. Also, I have the mental disorder of going back and watching the same stuff over and over again. Yeah, um, that's that's that. All that says is that the movie speaks to you. So. It's so it's amazing. But I, I, I think... And then I was like, oh, my God, they're going to do the same thing with Wonder Woman 2. I know that they've greenlighted Wonder Woman 3 already because yeah. it made its money on the box office weekend that it opened up. But I, I watched something like that and I was like, is it because our the bar was so high to me or is it because the movie actually just didn't even live up to what it was supposed to do? You know? Yeah, I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, I I. I... I think that the first film is, it, it is kind of like lightning in a bottle, just everything it did right. Uh, but I, I think that there, there's strange sort of plot issues in the second one where you sort of, you look at it and you're like, well, you needed another rewrite or two here. Like it, it, there's, there's issues that I feel like they could have licked. And, mm -hmm. and so that, you know, that's the stuff I look at and I'm like, well, why'd you, why'd you do it that way you know and i never want to put myself in the position of being like oh i know better than the filmmakers but definitely you take a step back and you say well there's like certain plot issues that if you move a few of the pieces around you, you get to where you need to but it 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 goes down easier you know right right um right. so so the, i think i think to your point like when i watched the second one i my reaction wasn't oh man this thing sucks let's just flip the apple cart i was like well i hope the third one is better you know and mm -hmm. so to me that and and what tends to happen is if they're able to sort of fix it with the next one, then you sort of you you have a more pleasant view of the previous one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, more of like a like a like a bump in the road. I mean, for me, uh, you know what did that for me was the Mandalorian. I had never oh, watched, sure. never watched Star Wars in my entire life. Never watched it. Never wasn't interested in it. Whatever it didn't speak to me. Yeah, I was like, I'll watch the Mandalorian because of John Favreau. Because I love him mm. so much. Anything yeah. he does, I'll watch it. I'll, I've also met the guy. He's awesome. Right? He's, He's great. great. Yeah. He's great. I interviewed him for, for Chef. Oh, did you? Oh, yeah, love awesome. that movie. Love that movie. It's so good. I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. Um, and then he also had like a, a, he also had a show on Netflix, like an actual cooking show because it was inspired mm -hmm. by Chef. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. yeah uh, I, I do. I forget the name, but yeah. With, a, with an uh, with an Asian chef, he's an American Asian mm -hmm. chef. Um, he's right. wonderful. He is wonderful. Um, the chef show. It's called the chef show. Is it the chef show? Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's what it's called. Thing. I think that's what yeah. it's called. I, and, I and by the way, can I can I tell you something? Yeah. Watching that movie changed my approach to criticism huh? because that's exactly what it's about. That's about this guy who just gets shit on by this critic, and it mm -hmm. just messes up his life, you know. Mm -hmm. And and it uh, watching that film really it it made me internalize a lot of uh, the conversation in that film and to try to, you know, you, you, whatever work I do, I want it to be uh, hopefully a positive part of the conversation rather than mm. just bringing people down, you know, because even if it's a bad movie, nobody sets out to make a bad movie, right? Sure. So that goes to what I was saying earlier. Like it, there's, if there's a constructive critique to be had, then even somebody who knows, like if it's a shit movie, they're going to know on some level, you know what I mean? That's right. So it's like, do you just want to like step on them when they're down, or do you want to say, "Hey, here, here, let me help you out." Here's here's yeah. what I think. Went Precisely. Wrong, you know? If you're making a dude, where's my car? You know that you made dude, where's my car? Like you know, <laughs> like there's no ifs or buts yeah. about that. But 
I watched The Mandalorian and I was like, okay, first of all, there's a baby Yoda in here. Shut the front door. Like, where do I go to buy a baby Yoda? I called up my brother and I was like, dude, have you been watching The Mandalorian? He was like, um, yeah. He was like, I grew up watching Star Wars. Hello. I was like, yeah, but I never watched it with you guys when you guys were watching. It was like a dude thing. You guys just watch a bunch of Star Wars and I didn't. And it inspired me so much because I wanted to know the origin of the Mandalorian. And I wa- went back and watched all the Star Wars Wow! that That's I had intense. never watched before because he inspired me so much to go back. And and what did you Star think? Wars. Oh, my God. The first and the second one is awesome. The first two are awesome. Yeah. And then I don't know what happened. When they had that <laughs> Hayden Christensen guy come in. They lost me. I was like, I, I'm I don't know what happened here. Uh, very easy on the eyes, you know. Uh, but man, yeah, no. I thought the older ones were just so amazing. Uh, I thought the, you know, the uh, season finale of The Mandalorian was incredible. Uh, yeah. Just loved every second of it. And this is someone who never cares for movies like that. I don't care yeah. for, you know, space, space stuff like no no what no interstellar i loved but that was more it was it had a very very powerful human story behind it but the mandalorian just really shifted my perspective so i think john favreau clearly has impacted both you and me for sure i mean he's (laughs) you know and kudos to john favreau for being so absolutely fantastic uh he's wonderful uh Zaki, where would you like people to follow you or where can they go and read your amazing um, perspective? Oh, wow. Well, um, it, it, I'm, I'm usually at the San Francisco Chronicle every week. I'm also at IGN. Uh, uh, my review, as I mentioned, of, of Godzilla vs. Kong should be going up, I think, early next week. If you mm-hmm. want to find me on social media, that's probably the best place to find me on Twitter at Zaki's Corner, Z-A-K-I-S Corner. That's also my website, just add a .com. And uh, please check out the Movie Film Podcast, which drops every other week with news and reviews about the latest releases. And we have commentary tracks every other week where we watch a movie and we talk through it and offer our uh, observations and, uh, you know, behind the scenes stories and whatnot. So a lot of fun. Awesome. Awesome. Zaki, it was a pleasure, man. I hope you'll come back and talk to us some more. I, I, uh, I was honored that you asked. I'm always happy to come on. Thank you very much, man. Take care. Take care. Thanks, Mike. That was the amazing Zaki Hassan. Uh, I really, I really learned a lot talking to him about movies and critics and even my perspective on critics. You guys, if you have not subscribed to my YouTube channel, please do. You can go to youtube.com forward slash Mona Shake Comedian and you can also follow me on Twitter. Uh, at uh, Instagram at Mona's Comedy and also on uh, Facebook and TikTok at Mona Shake Comedian. Uh, you guys have a good evening. I will be back tomorrow with a brand new guest. And also, if you have Hulu or ABC, my episode is getting kicked off on The Rookie. The first episode for season three is my episode where I play Donna Abbasi on The Rookie on ABC. And it's going to be this Sunday at 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 10 Eastern, and 9 Central. So, you guys, uh, I would love for you to go check it out. That would be amazing. Have a good evening. And also, I actually... I might as well I'm, well, I'm here. Uh, I actually also have a show that is going to be live streaming tomorrow. Uh, I'm going to be headlining that at 7.30 p.m. Pacific. And then on Saturday, I got booked to go and perform in solidarity with my Asian brothers and sisters on Saturday night at around 8 p.m. Pacific uh, at the Laugh Factory. That is a free show. I'm going to be making those posts on my social media. You can totally check them out, uh, you know, sign up for them. But uh, that's about it for me. You guys, have a good evening. I will see you tomorrow. Good night. <laughs>